We spend about 100,000 or more, a million dollars on our homes. But do you realize that we can even spend as much, that much money on our education? And I can think of a scripture, which is Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he or she is old, and she, he or she will not depart from it. We do a lot of emphasis on our kids for elementary education and for secondary education for Christian schools. And I believe that college Christian education is just as important. Now there are several ways to go about helping our kids pay for college, not only to pay for college, but to stay in college. Do you know that in 2001, is that right? 2001, in a public school, it cost $27,054 a year for college education. Take a guess how much it's going to cost, how much it would cost in 2005, with um, the increase, inflation is about 2.5%, roughly. Tuition goes up about between 5 and 7%. I have another gift. Who can guess how much it would come to, a close guess, to 2005 for college education. 2001 was 27.54. Nah, that's 2028. <laughs> Unless it's a private Ivy League college. It's not that hard. I'm just trying to get everybody engaged to here. That's close enough. $29,690. Thank you, sir. In 2011, it was 31,975. Now take a guess, how much does it cost Oakwood students to pay for their school uh, books for the year? It's a couple hundred dollars. Who wants to take a guess? Professor Patty? Bingo, $1,000 a prize for Professor Patty. A thousand dollars it costs for books for the school semester. Now, as we know, with higher education, we also, once we're finished with college, can get a higher paycheck. A high school diploma can make you about $33,800 a year. When you have a bachelor's degree, it goes up over 20000 Your salary could be about $55,700. When you have a master's degree, it comes up to about 67300 This is from the U.S. Census Bureau. I want to talk a little bit about the cost, what help is available, some options for savings, and strategies along the way. There are several benefits that comes to us when we put money away for college and when we're paying for college education. One of them is the HOPE credit that the government gives us for post-secondary education. Now it's not money, um, it's not that you pay less taxes. Uh, let me rephrase that. Post-education gives you uh, credit against your tax liability when you apply for the HOPE credit. Now there are limitations that do apply and you would need to talk to your tax advisor. The next uh, benefit that you get is a lifetime learning credit, which can give you up to 20% of the first 10,000 that you pay for a college education. Now, you can apply for both. It's either one or the other, either the HOPE credit or the lifetime credit. And there are limitations that do apply for that as well. Now, there's also the higher education tax deduction which can give you up to $4,000 deduction against your, your credit, your tax liability. And for the state of Alabama, if you contribute to a 529 plan, you can contribute up to $5,000 and you can take that as a tax deduction on your income tax return per parent, per child. So I'm telling you about getting some free money when you do have your kids in college and also some free money 
when you plan to, um, to start saving for your kids to go to college. I propose that we save on a monthly basis. It doesn't, college does cost a lot of money, that's true, but you have to start. You can start with as little as $50 a month, you can start with $100 a month, and those of us who can do more, I say do more. Just make it a disciplined approach and make it consistent. One of the things that I do, I'm a financial advisor. I work for PNC Investments in our North Madison office. That's the closest branch that's here. I've been doing this for over the past 14 years, and I'm here to help in any way that I can to help you get on that path. And college education is just a tiny piece of what I do. I do, uh, I'm a fully fledged uh, financial advisor. And you would have to talk to me, I have my cards, and we can always figure something out. Another way to put money aside for education is in an ATMA account or a UGMA. It's an irrevocable gift that you give to a child for college. And anyone can contribute to that fund. Um, there's also the Coverdell program, which is the maximum of $2,000 that you can put away towards not only higher education, but also secondary and elementary education. And the 529, which I talked about earlier, you can put money away in that particular investment vehicle and that money grows tax deferred. Once you use the money for college, it's tax free. And I forgot to mention, there's some handouts going around which pretty much um, give you some bullet points on what I'm talking about. I'm going to ask another question. There's another prize for this one. How much is it the dorm damage fee for Oakwood University? See, I can't make it. Go ahead, sweetie. Close enough. $250. <laughs> you did? Okay, you get the prize. I believe you. We're in church. I believe you. <laughs> That's right, $250. So you can see all these little fees add up when we want to put our kids in college. Once you decide, you and the child decide to go to college, I believe it's a dual thing. It's a mom and dad and child. You as a mom, parent, you have your expectations and you have to have expectations from our children. We need to start early. The earlier we start, the easier it gets as you put that money away. Just like how you put money away in a 401k, you keep doing it regardless, it just comes out. We need to do the same thing with college. And when we talk with our kids, we let our kids know that you know, this is what it's going to be. Don't be afraid to have those financial conversations with our children. They're a part of the family and the more we include them in it, they become, it helps them become more responsible. And their part is, researching scholarship, um, finding a job, and saving that money instead of blowing it on the next pair of shoes, you know? So involve the children in planning for college. Once you've made that decision, you meet with a professional, such as myself, you, we take a look at what your financial profile looks like and how we're going to put some money aside. We make a decision of how much that's going to be. And we make a de decision about what that goal is, how much, if it's just the first year you're going to be able to put aside, that's okay. And we develop an action plan together of where that money is going to come from. Don't panic over the numbers. In 2028, in a private school, it's going to cost about $347 for that four years. So don't panic over the numbers, but when you take action, 347,000. Yeah, in 2028. So if you have babies now, I'm here to help. Okay? In the handouts that I gave you, there are some website that you can go to that can give you some more information about what college cost is gonna look like. There's the um, College Counts, which is the Alabama website. 
It has some really great information on there, and I encourage you to take a look at that. And I do have cards, as I said, and I'm also here to help you. And there are many financial advisors out there, but see, I'm Seventh-day Adventist, so you can trust me, and I invite you to come and speak with me whenever you get a chance. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you very much, Sandy. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I was informed that uh, by uh, the other two presenters that we would need to move a little closer because they want to present some information to us on the screen that you need to see close up. Okay? This is the uh, information that you will need. So could we move a little closer? Come to the, about by where the, the cameras are located along here. No one wants to move? All right. If you okay, okay. Okay. Um, we are aware that this program is being streamed to three churches um, outside of the city, and I know that they may want to ask questions. I'm going to suggest that if they need to, if anyone wants to ask a question, you could call me on my cell phone or, or send me a text. My cell phone number is 615-481-2550. If you need to ask a question while this seminar is in progress, or rather during the time when we are taking questions, Call me on 615-481-2550 and we'll do everything we can to accommodate your questions. Before I introduce myself, we have a video that uh, we want to share with you just very briefly. Um, I first saw the house and I had to have it. I had looked at probably 40 houses maybe 50, over a period of a number of months. And I knew that when I saw it, that would be it. Um, I, I never will forget telling Doug that I found it. And um, when he saw the house too, he was like, nice house, but. And um, as the more we uh, consulted with our advisor, and looked at the, at the um, pill method and sat down with Don who introduced us to the program. When you introduced us to the program, we knew that it was transferable. We knew that it could make sense not only for the property that we were in, but if we wanted to move into another property, we began to uh, do some math and, and exploration and came to the conclusion that we actually could afford this very beautiful home. We could afford to pay it off. We would not be locked into it at our age for a number of years. And I mean, for 30 years, we'd be 90. 100? Uh, <laughs> it's a definite <laughs> so, uh, so what happened is, I looked at, we looked at the house, and um, in our consultation, we could see that it was a dream that really could come true, that made sense. And um, we looked at it as an investment, and the way Don Daniel put it to us, the pill method makes your investment a dream that you can actually live in. You can experience it while you are considering it your investment. That was very wonderful. 
it was like uh, someone had just taken blinders off. I remember when Don explained that program to me. I popped my head in the head, my head said, oh, it's just as clear as that. You know, once he, once he broke it down, like I said, the bottom line is we don't really understand where our money goes. We don't understand what we are being charged to have what we have. And it's right there in front of me. And it's like, I, I remember that day. It was like a revolution. You know? Yeah, and it's not like it was hidden information. It was laying right there in front of me. You just don't see it. And I think that's a strength of most of the financial institutions that they hope you don't see it. But uh, uh, there is a way to avoid Thanks to God, I see there's a way to avoid um, paying money that you don't know they have to pay. And uh, that's the thing that got me. Rosenblum Realty has been serving the Huntsville area for 55 years in this next year in 2012. So it is a really, it's, it's an exciting time for us. My great grandfather and my grandfather started the company back in 1957. So my father is the operating broker. I'm fourth generation coming into it. And the Rosenblum Realty is just sort of a, a household name. People locally here know who we are and it's been a great benefit for us. Every single client that I work with, I recommend this program to everyone. Uh, whenever we sit down and we start talking about, my goodness, I've got a 30 year mortgage. I'm trapped for life. I've, I've sold my life away to my home now. Uh, I sit down with them and I say, I want to show you just how easy it is to pay off this mortgage in a third of the time or less but because I'm doing it. That, that's what I'm doing right now. Uh, so I recommend this program to every single one of my clients that I'm faced with every single day. Take Six is, I've always said, Take Six is a lifestyle. It's not even a career or a job, it's a lifestyle. You're always uh, one of the guys. Um, it's not exactly special forces, but we can get a call at any time. You gotta have your pack and be ready to go. I literally left Thanksgiving one night for South Africa. Um, and took off 27 hours, got down there, sang, turned around and came back. Um, this Tuesday coming up, I'm going to Shanghai, China. Within the last two months, I mean, the last two weeks, I've been to Brazil, all over the place. I just did a red eye from California coming in here to Atlanta. Just nonstop, always going. And that's just the take six side of it. And yeah, there's, there, when I'm home, there's, I'm also doing the Hollywood Shuffle, which is, Anything that anybody's hiring for, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do it. You figure it out by the time you get there. You don't realize how your financial life impacts everything. I'm talking about it, it impacts your relationships, your, your marriage, your, your, your uh, approach to family life, the kind of time that you have to share and give. Um, when you start getting your affairs in order, you start working out. And I mean, it, sounds, it might sound melodramatic, but you start tightening up the areas of your life. You know, it's like different things that you just kind of let go on autopilot. You just kind of ATM your life. You don't do that. Uh, so this allows you to have the tools and allows you to peek behind the curtain to see how these things are timed out, how they are calculated, what you can do to use some of the tricks that the bank uses to leverage your own money your own sense of wealth to empower yourself for financial freedom in the future. Um, it just showed me uh, a lot of who, what's going on with this wizard behind the behind the curtain. And you know, I, I I'm not a math guy. I don't know everything all, but I can follow the instructions. I know this thing says move this money from here to here on this date. I can follow that, and it'll show you if you follow the instructions and are obedient to the financial laws, not your opinion their opinions, mama's advice, uncle T's uh, um, stick the money under the mattress advice, it will get you where you want to go. I take lots of flights to Atlanta and LAX. I like going there back and forth, but I never fly myself. You know, you want somebody who is a professional doing what they do. Um, your financial life is a, there are world markets that are clicking around the clock. There are things that impact every second of the day and for you to think that you can do what you've never done like you've never done it without the tools it's just not going to happen you need somebody you need a powerful software you need somebody that um that is going to have the tenacity the um the mental fortitude and the character 
to be able to usher you through these scary times in a forthright and in a manner that is going to get you to your goals and to your freedom. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jason Thomas, and I am a recovering mortgage broker. I tell you that because for many years, I've been fortunate enough to help many, many families. But the one thing that I did, I committed financial violence. Let me explain to you what I mean. I graduated from Oakwood University with a degree in finance. And with that degree, I moved to South Florida, the hottest market, real estate market in the country at the time, where our average loan size was over $500,000 had a team of loan officers that worked for me. And in our office, we refinanced many loans. We helped families get into mortgages. But our allegiance has always been to the banks. You guys understand that? And for the bank holders, they are concerned about a return on investment. My duty to you is to solely show you which one of our products is best for you. You understand that so far? Now then, you have a couple of choices and we share them with you based on the information that we get from the banks. If you ever want to know who's making the most money, drive into any big city and look at the tallest buildings. And what are they? They're banks and insurance companies. Am I correct about that? Now the information we're going to share with you tonight, I did not learn this information in school. See, this information you learn in school and this information you learn on the streets and this inf information you learn behind closed doors. The information you learn behind closed doors does not filter out to the general public because if it did, you would be saving money instead of losing money. You got that so far? Now, the three individuals that you saw tonight, I want to make it clear. The information you are going to learn tonight, we give it away for free. You got that? You don't have to hold on to your pocketbooks. We give the information away for free. Tonight. <laughs> Only tonight. Everyone else pays for it. See, these seminars we do around the country. Mainly if we're doing it to churches, they're Sunday churches. If there's reasons for that. We don't have to deal with some of the hassle that we do with some of the Adventist churches. They want to pay you pittance to be able to come out to a presentation for information that we can actually charge four or five thousand dollars for and get away with that. You understand that? Because the information we're going to share with you is to help you save money. Now, the interesting thing about what I did for, for a number of years is that the average client that I had was an A credit individual. That's a person that has a 660 credit score above. Now, what's interesting about that particular client was that the type of loans that I was giving them, A loans from major banks, they were paying upwards of 300, 405% interest. How many of you have a mortgage right now? How many of you are paying over 100% interest on your loans? 300, I hear 300. How many of you have a 6% interest loan, 6% interest loan or lower? You do. We're going to share with you some of the secrets that you've never learned. No financial planner would teach you. No CPA even knows this information. As a matter of fact, when we share this information, we have to tell our clients, do not go to a financial planner, do not go to the accountant, do not go to anyone who thinks they know finance because they have never heard this information before. 
And three of the individuals that you saw on the screen are three of the individuals that we've been able to help so far. Are you guys ready to hear this information? Now let me share with you how I got involved in this because this is critical to putting the big picture together. You see, I was in Huntsville about three, four years ago coming from Miami to do a presentation unrelated to this. And everyone went around the room and introduced themselves as to who they were and what they did. And there was one inter individual that introduced themselves, himself, shared with the audience, with the group, what his personal testimony was regarding his finances. Now, at, at the end of my presentation, everybody wanted his business card, believe it or not. A week later, my father called me and said, Jason, you know the house that we just built out in Madison, which by this time was probably about two, two years old. Well, the same individual named Don Daniel came to our house, shared with us a presentation about what you, we're talking about on the screen, which you just saw. And at the end of the presentation, my father was going to be able to save over $200,000 of interest on his mortgage, pay off a 30-year loan, which he had for less than five years so far, pay it off in less than nine years without having to refinance. His monthly payments remained the same, and his monthly budget didn't change. Did you hear what I just said? His monthly payments remained the same. His monthly budget did not change. That's the critical part. Had I known this information when I was a mortgage broker, it would have changed everything that I did in the industry. I did not know this information even as a trained, licensed mortgage broker. When my father called me up, he shared with me the story. I said, Dad, doesn't sound for real. I need to talk to this gentleman. Put me on the phone with Don, and he did a presentation. I was actually sitting at home in the condo at the time, going over it. It was, it was via a webinar that we had. And when he explained an amortization table, now mind you, Mortgage brokers, we don't look at amortization tables. We look at the truth and lending statement to determine how much we're going to make at the end of the loan. That's what we look at, okay? We have no knowledge of how an amortization table works. He pulled one up for me and started to explain to me the parameters and exactly how an amortization table worked. Once I saw the information, I was actually blown away. We took the information, and that, that, at that time I said, Don, you have to get down here to South Florida. Don came down to South Florida, and we started going from church to church. I was fortunate enough to get one of the largest Sunday churches in South Florida on our program. And as a matter of fact, Don actually came down, stayed, here for two, stayed with me for two weeks, went back up, and then moved to South Florida and stay for a whole month. We work from 8 a.m. to 2 a.m. in the morning in helping individuals and helping churches. Now, in tonight's presentation, we're going to go through some of the exact points that we share. Now, mind you, we do not have enough time to go through everything. We're just going to go over the surface of some of the information. It is very, very imperative that you listen very attentively. And I want to introduce to you my mentor and the individual that helped me get started, Mr. Don Daniel. Good, ev good evening, everyone. If we can put the presentation on the screen, we'll go ahead and get started. Everybody is tired, and we do not want to weary the saints anymore. The name of the presentation is If They Knew They Were Slaves. Harriet Tubman said, I freed a thousand slaves. I could have freed a thousand more if what? If they only knew they were slaves. Pill method stands for, pill stands for prepayment of principal, isolation of principal amounts, leverage, and liquidity. 
If you understand these four basic principles, you begin to understand how the bank makes its money. Now, let me tell you one thing before we actually get started. Um, uh, Malcolm Court, anybody know Malcolm Court in here? Malcolm Court loves cricket. I've had the opportunity to go over to his house several times, and he has the cricket channel. Cricket has so many rules, I don't know if they can print a book large enough so you can understand all the rules. I didn't understand cricket, I didn't like cricket, I didn't know what was going on. And so we're watching this thing, and he says, Don, this is how they score this many points. This is what happens when they do this. I started getting the rules, and when I started getting the rules, I started to understand the game. I started to enjoy it more. I said, Malcolm, can I go and play cricket now? He said, oh, Don, you know, you, you, you've been watching it for 20 minutes. Now you're going to go and try to play cricket? I don't think so. Folks, you're going to understand some things you've never understood before tonight. But what I'm trying to tell you is you're going to get just enough information to be dangerous. <laughs> Do not attempt this at home on your own. Get some help. You're going to get encouraged, you're going to be excited, but please do not try to do this all on your own. Get some help, all right? So here we go. Do you see that formula on the, on, on the screen there? That's the culprit. That gives the bank a mathematical advantage. And let me tell you, I love the bank. I am not anti-bank. I couldn't afford my house or my car or education without the bank. But what I'm trying to tell you is, just like cricket, we have been playing a game that we have not known the rules to our entire lives because it's not taught anywhere. And I'm going to tell you, my extensive financial background is uh, 17 years as a firefighter in Battle Creek, Michigan. It's not taught anywhere. I was just tired of being broke, just tired of not having enough, just tired of all my money going out. Started studying this thing, and the Bible says that if I lack wisdom, I can do what? I can ask of God. And do you know what? He just gives the information and gives the information. Do you know he's still giving me information on this? Let's go ahead and get started. We're going to start with student loan larceny. With a student loan, I'm going to show you how an amortization schedule works. In fact, this student loan belongs to one of my clients. He was able to get through all of his schooling and only have a student loan of $9,500. How about that? Is that all you have? No, okay. So $9,500 at 6%. And he says, Don, I only got a student loan and a car I don't, of $9,000. I don't think there's anything you can do for me. I said, what's your interest rate? He said, it's 6%. I said, what's your monthly payment? He said, $50 a month. I asked him, when will you be done paying for that loan? How many years is it going to take you? You know what he told me? He didn't know. Any guesses? How many years? 30 years? Any guesses? I heard 20. One more. 10. Let's see. That's $9,500 at $50 a month at 6% interest. 601 payments. That is 50 plus years. That's a $9,500 loan. Let me show you how it all works. Here is the total interest paid on that loan. Can you see it? That's just the interest on the loan. The entire loan, when it's paid back, will be $30,050. Total interest, $20,550. Folks, that's a total interest paid as a percentage of principal. That is your effective interest rate, 216%. Here's how it works. Do you see that number one payment? $2.50 goes to principal. How much goes to interest? That's why it's taken so long. But it gets better the very next month. How much interest do we pay the very next month? 
Let me show you how simple this is. Remember the P in, in pill principle? The P stands for prepayment. You know that you can send the bank money anytime you want before the money is due, and you can prepay your loan. If you do that, you're going to cut interest, and you're going to cut time off your loan. Do you know how it works? Do you know why it works? Every banker, every CPA, every um, financial planner I talk to does not know what happens when you prepay a loan. They don't know till they talk to us. Let me show you. You're going to pay $2.50 on your loan. You're going to give the bank $47.50 to process that $2.50 payment. All right? Then, as you see there, um, $9,497.50 is the month in balance on line one. Remember this, you're going to need it later. The month in balance determines how much you owe on the very next line of your schedule. The month in balance does what? Determines how much you owe on the very next line of your schedule. So line one determines what you pay on line, on line two. You're getting it now. So line two. So now on line two, you pay $2.51 to principal. Now, if line one is January and line two is February, do you have to wait till February to give the bank that additional $2.51? Can you give it to the bank in January if you have it? Will they subtract any interest from that $2.51 over and above your payment? No, they will not. You can make your payment of $50 and give the bank an additional $2.51 in the same month, and they will not charge you anymore. What happens then? All right? If you give the bank that at $2.51, you are paid down to the month in balance on line two in the first month. Is that correct? All right? So if you're paid down to line two in January, your next payment then is on which line? Exactly. That's your payment on line three. So, folks, what happened to the $47.49 on line two? Okay, now, everybody who's on my program cannot talk. <laughs> okay? Okay. That's right. You save that $47.49, you never, ever have to pay it. Did you know that? You just, for giving the bank $2.51 early, I don't care if it's due on the 1st, and you wait till the 31st to give the bank that extra money, you do not have to pay the interest on that line. All right? So, here's how it, I want you to take a look at um, the... the the, uh, the third column there is cumulative principle. That's how much principle you would pay down in one year on this loan, $30.84. The next column over, column four, is your cumulative principle. How much interest do you have to give the bank to pay them $30.84 in one year? Uh, folks, I, I think the benefit I, th I think the, the cost is outweighing the benefit here. Do you realize, is, how fair is that? How legal is it? Very legal. All right. So to give the bank $30.84, it will cost us $569.16. Let me ask you, if the $30.84 represents every payment in column one, do I have to give them that $30.84 in 12 monthly installments? Can I give it to them in one installment? If I did prepay $30.84 on line one, I eliminate all of those interest charges I never have to pay. Interest between line two and line 12. I save $569.16 for giving the bank the $30.84 early. Did you know that? Do you know it now? All right. Are you beginning to enjoy the game a little more now? This is like me watching cricket. <laughs> I can see, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So when they hit the thing and they start running back and forth, I said, yeah, it's enjoyable now. 
All right, let me show you something else here. We're going to take a look at line 25 on this thing. This is, after, this is two years and one month. I'm going to show you a little bit about isolating the principal amount and leverage now, just a little bit. Now, I'm not recommending that you do this. I'm just teaching you how to use uh, the bank's money efficiently, all right? Let's just say, let's just say you didn't have $66.39 to throw at this thing because in 25 months, you would pay your loan down by $66.39. How much is the bank going to charge you on this loan? Can you believe that? $1,183.61 in interest to pay your loan down by $66.39. Now, I don't have 66, but I'm going to borrow it from Jason. He's got it. Oh, Jason's got it. I'm going to charge him, too. <laughs> You're going to charge me, Jason? Yes, sir. How much are you going to charge me? At least 10% interest. You're going to charge me 10% interest. Okay, I got a 6% loan. Does it make sense to borrow money at 10% from Jason to put on my 6% loan? I hear yes and I hear no. Okay, Here, here's what I want you to do. Always ask, what is the cost and what is the benefit? What's the cost and what is the benefit? You'll never go wrong with money if you ask those two questions. Do you know we get in the habit of asking only one question? How much does it cost? We hear the cost, we run the other way without ever hearing the benefit. Mm -hmm. That doesn't help us. Watch this. I'm going to borrow $66.39 from Jason. I'm going to take an entire year to pay him back. All right? I'm going to put that $66.39 and, uh, and on my student loan at the beginning. All right? If I do, let's see what happens. Uh-oh. Stop that. Let's go back. Don't give them... All right. So I'm going to do this. We're going to take that $9,500 and we're going to subtract $66.39. That gives us $94.33.61, doesn't it? Isn't that the same month in balance on line 25? Are you kidding me? If I give the bank $66.39 in one month, I'm paid all the way down. I skipped two years worth of payments? Mm. Two years? And I save $1,100 in interest? Folks, is that a better use of your money? If you use your money this way and pay that loan off early and not giving the bank that $1,183.61, what happens to that money? You say, what? You get to pocket it? All right, and, and then um, give it to this lady over here to invest for you. All right, so here's what's happening, folks. We can spend the money better ourselves because that interest money, when it goes to the bank, how much of it helps you? None. It's putting shoes on somebody else's kid's feet. It's paying for somebody else's kid's college education. What about yours? Okay. Let's take a look at this. Air conditioning. Now, now before we go to this next question, we pass these out two Sabbaths ago. Do you remember seeing these? Do you realize we, there were seven questions on here and I tallied the results. We only had two individuals in this church who got five out of the seven correct. Two. We only had four people that got three out of the seven correct. And so we're going to go over these questions tonight. The, the second question that we're going to go over next is if you want to save money on a mortgage, is it best to have a 30-year loan or a 15-year loan? How many say 30? How many say 15? That's most everybody, Jason. It's mostly everyone. Let's go over this one, Don. All right. If you want to save money on a mortgage, is it best to have a 30-year loan or a 15-year loan? Let's take a look. First of all, when, you, when you're talking about a 15-year loan, you're talking about a bank product. Any business people in the audience? Okay, there's some business people. All right? If you were selling a product, 
and it was not selling, how long would you keep it on your shelves? Not long? Okay. So here's the thing, folks. What I'm asking is this. With air conditioning, air conditioning stands for aggressive institutionalized reprogramming or reconditioning. Aggressive institutionalized reconditioning. The bank has a lot of money in conditioning us to keep coming to the bank and asking the bank how to save money. Now think about it. Now, in the whole universe, the whole universe, there's, a, there's probably one person I wouldn't even dream about asking about salvation. And who's that? Satan himself. <laughs> so listen, why would I go to a bank to learn how to save money? Unless I was conditioned to do so, I get in such a habit of doing it, it feels natural. It's a bank product. So the first thing you got to ask about a bank product is, how does the bank make money on this? Because if, if they weren't making money, it wouldn't be on their shelves. All right? So now a, the bank does a comparison between a 15-year loan and a 30-year loan. And obviously, you're going to pay less interest on a 15-year loan, correct? But to do that, your payment is higher than it would be on a 30-year loan. All right? Now, we just noticed what happens when you put extra money on a loan after you make a payment, correct? Well, if your payment is higher, which is a great deal of your budget on a mortgage, how much extra money do you have if you already got an inflated payment trying to make a 15-year payment? Okay? So how are you going to... So that what, they're, what they're hoping is you take a look at that thing and say, hmm, oh, and by the way, they never talk about a 15-year payment until you start talking about wanting to pay the loan off faster. Then they trot out, oh, we have a solution for you. Oh, watch out when the bank offers a solution. And remember, I like the bank. Some of the best... Yeah, she says, some of my best friends are bankers. That's true. <laughs> All right? But here's the thing. Once that thing trots out as a solution to my problem, I've got to ask, mm, how much is it going to cost me, right? So now, we're going to take that comparison. I'm going to pay less interest. I feel that I'm already saving. A 15-year uh, loan is 180 months. That means I'm going to make all 180 payments. Do you know my average client kills about 230 payments they never make? The 15-year loan and the 30-year loan pay off in the same amount of time on my program. So here's the thing. If you did not know this, what you could do, and I'll give you a little secret. Even if you don't want to learn more about this from Jason or myself, if you want to pay the loan off early, always, 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 what did I say? Always get a 30-year loan and make the 15-year payment. <laughs> All right? So if you get the 30-year loan and make the 15-year payment, what happens when things get tight one month? You can always drop back to the 30-year payment. You have options. All right? Now, here's what happens with, a, with, with a, uh, a mortgage. It's not like that with every loan, but most mortgages are this way. Mortgages only accept full payments. They only accept full payments. Anybody know what a bi-weekly program is? Okay, so that's where you pay twice a month. Now, how many believe that when you pay twice a month, you are actually saving interest in that month because you're paying twice a month? Right? You're not. Because mortgages only accept what? When you make your first payment on the first of the month, that's just half a payment. So you have not met the criteria for a, and on the 15th when you send them their money, you just gave them the other half. So you're not saving any interest in that month. You want to know how it works? I'll tell you how it works. There are two months out of the year where you're making three of those half payments. When you make that third half payment in that month, that's when you're saving the interest. 
Now, why would a bank go through all that trouble to offer a bi-weekly program? I'll tell you why. Because some of you, <laughs> some of you were getting smart and using up your, um, uh, what, what's that, that period between the 1st and the 15th, the grace period, grace Jason? Period. The grace period? Some of you were using that grace period. So what happens? I pay my, if I pay my mortgage on the 1st, who has my money? Who's making interest on that money? All right. So if I keep my money until the 15th and then give it to the bank, is there any penalty for that? Do they charge me any extra interest for that? No. And they know that. There's a reason for that, and we'll get into it. We can't get into all the reasons because we only have a limited time. We have to come back for another seminar to do that. So here's what happens, folks. When you make that payment on, on the 15th instead of on the 30th, you can keep that money in your savings account for 15 extra days. Now who's making the interest? You are now at a quarter percent interest. It doesn't seem like very much, does it? But it doesn't take much money put on principle to save a lot of money in interest. We have already seen that, right? So if you had a few pennies to put on principle, that would save you a lot of money in interest. So stop poo-pooing the pennies because banks don't make millions of dollars. Banks make two or three cents millions of times a day. So stop walking over the pennies in the parking lot. I picked every single one of them up. Every single one. Okay? All right. Now, get a 30 and make a 15-year payment. You always want to be in charge of how prepayments are applied. Never let anyone take that from you. You want to be able to apply your cash to the, the, uh, your loan in a way that benefits you the most. Okay? And remember this. They both pay off in the same time if you're using the pill method. All right. Down payment deception. All right, Jason. This, is, this was question number three. When acquiring a new mortgage, you should try to make the largest down payments you can in order to save interest. True or false? Well, if you, you say that now. <laughs> <laughs> what did you answer when you had the test? True. Because people, you, you know, you want to put down. Now, I have a client right here as a businessman right here in Huntsville, Alabama. He came to me, he's building a $400,000 home, okay? He asked me if he should put down his $100,000 so he could finance $300,000 instead of $400,000 at 3% for 30 years. Does that, on the face of that, does that sound sensible? Okay, all right. But what did I tell him? I told him, he needs the $400,000 loan for 30 years, not the $300,000. Does that make sense yet? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. No, it doesn't make sense yet, but let's, let's find out how it makes sense because we have to do the math, all right? $400,000 principal at 3% for 30 years. This is how it breaks down, all right? The interest paid back on that is $207 thousand one hundred eleven dollars and twenty cents right there right there when you're sitting at the closing table you should have asked the question if I borrow four hundred thousand and I pay back two hundred thousand well I'm not a math major Jason but that doesn't look like three percent to me absolutely not what does that look like to you that looks like fifty percent Remember that formula in the beginning? That formula gives the bank a mathematical advantage. You know what a mechanical advantage is, like a pulley system? Where um, I can get, you can have a 500 pound weight in the middle of the floor and set up a pulley system and, and a, a, a 100 pound woman can lift that with one hand? Okay, where you take less energy to move a heavy weight. The bank put that amortization schedule in place so it takes a lot more energy to pay off a loan. So it takes, to move a dollar in principle to pay it off takes about five or six dollars of interest to move one dollar. What you want to do is get it down to about 50 cents. 
We'll show you how. Okay? So, here's the thing. He's going to repay $607,000. So, his total percentage of principal he's going to pay is 51.778 because of that amortization schedule. All right? So he says, well, Don, well, t just take a look. If I have the $300,000 loan, he's trying to tell me this, and I'm saying he's right. He's going to pay $155,000 in interest. So he's only going to pay back $455,000. All right? So here's the math. When you subtract the interest from the $400,000 loan, from, and then you subtract the $300,000 uh, interest from that loan, you save how much money? Jason, does that seem like a lot of money? No. Okay. Is that enough money to, to, to save? I mean, $51,000? That's significant, isn't it? Yes, it is. So this is what he's trying to tell me. He says, now I'm going to save $51,000. I said, well, let's do some more math. Here's the amortization schedule on the $400,000 loan. All right? His first payment on the $400,000 loan is $1,686.42. $686.42 goes to principal. How much goes to interest? $1,000. How, how much does that help my client? None. All right? So now, what do we do now? His first payment is $1,686.42. So he makes his first payment on the loan. Then he does what? He takes his $100,000 and applies it to principal after the first payment. Exactly. Is it beginning to make more sense now? Okay. Did everybody catch that? Did you get that? So what he's doing is not... He's not paying the $100,000 before he establishes the loan. He establishes the loan and then pays his $100,000. What, what did you say, man? Yes! Watch this. So, if he puts the $100,000 down after he gets the loan, guess what? He's all the way down to line 125 of his amortization schedule the first month. How much interest does he save? $110,000 in interest he'll never have to pay. By applying the $100,000 after the loan instead of before the loan. Anybody ever tell you that? Do you think the person that owns the bank knows this? So why do they encourage you to apply your 100000 before the loan instead of after the loan? Ah, all right. And he just knocked off two years. Well, look, how, look how much he's knocked off. So applying $100,000, prepayment instead of a down payment. Prepayment instead of a down payment. He saves $110,000 in interest and eliminates... 10 years, three months from his, pay, uh, from his mortgage immediately. Immediately. Now, this is what I told him. Now you only have 19 years, nine months left on your mortgage right now. Continuing to use the pill method, continue to use the pill method, I'm going to show him how he's going to pay the rest of the loan off in just seven years, and he's going to buy that house with a total interest payment of what? $30,000. Would you like to know how to do that? All right, we'll show you how to do that. Guess what? I'm his new best friend. <laughs> All right. Which loan, which loan do you think the bank loves the most? The $400,000 loan or the $300,000? I'm sorry? $300,000. Oh, see, you've been sitting in the class too long. All right. Let's do the comparison. Now, the bank would make more money on the $400,000. They make $207,000. And on the $300,000 loan, they make $155,000. But guess what? You don't look at how much money they make. Ask the investment counselor. You want to see how much 
interest you make on your money. It's the percentage that you make. It is the ROI. What does ROI stand for? Return on investment. Return on investment. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you like to, this, this is not a trick question, would you like to make a million dollars on your investment or five million on your investment? Five million on your investment. Let me ask it another way. Would you like to make one million dollars with two hundred and fifty thousand dollars invested or five million with four million dollars invested? The first one, okay? So here's what the bank does. They don't look at how much money I make, they look at how much money I can make on my money, percentage-wise. So, here's the math. On this loan, this is what the amortization schedule does for the bank. On this loan, their ROI is 51.778. What's the ROI on the second one? The same thing. The only thing we get out of putting the $100,000 down is that we feel better doing it. The bank makes the same amount of money. But they love the $300,000 loan. Why? Because they have less risk. I can make the same amount of money with less risk. I get you to give me your hard-earned $100,000. You feel better. I make more money. I love that. All right. Here's refi fantasy. Now, I asked Jason to do this one because Jason used to do refinances all the time. And Jason is going to lead out on refi fantasy. Now, the reason why we're going about this is interest rates are at an all-time low. What is everybody doing? Refinancing. Is your mailbox stuffed with offers? Hmm. Let me ask you one question. If you're saving money, who's losing it? Oh, see, that got caught in your throat, didn't it? <laughs> the bank is not going to lose money on this deal. Would you, like to try, would you like to know how the bank makes money on a refinance? Jason Thomas. Well, it, it, it actually sounds foreign because if the banks, if you're saying the banks are losing money, they're calling you up, are they not, to refinance your house? No one is going to be calling you to offer a product that they're losing money on. Does that make sense? It, it, it just doesn't make any sense, does it? On the face of it. But that is to allure you. You think that they're losing money, but they're actually making more money. Let's, ex let's see how. Here was the question, number four on the list, that we had on the questionnaire. It says, if I have a $200,000 loan, at 6% interest, and the bank is offering to refinance it for me at 3%, rolling in the closing costs. So you actually have to pay, come with, to the table with nothing. Should I take it? The majority of people, other than three people who took that quiz, everybody said yes. Now let's look at it. Let's go over the terms of the loan. $200,000 loan that we have at 6% over 30 years. The monthly payment on that is $1,199 per month. We have that so far? $200,000 at 6% interest. Let's take a look at what that's going to come out to. Over the 30 years, $231,676,000 of interest is what we will be paying. Jason, you only borrowed 200000 but you've got to pay back 231000 in interest? That's exactly correct. Well, that can't be right. You guys see that so far? That's a 6% loan. That's 6%. See, and, and this is what you're running from. This is a 6% loan that you have. Okay. So the total amount that you will be repaying back on the loan that, that we currently have here on the screen is 431676 J We borrowed 200000 and now we're paying back over 431000 Jason, my house is $200,000. It's worth 200000 You mean I've got to pay $400,000 for it? Does that look like 6% interest to anybody? What did you just say? I don't think anybody heard that. 
I said it looks like a hundred percent interest rate. O over that. Hundred and fifteen point eight three nine. And we're all doing it. So the problem that we have in this country is that we do not carry 30-year loans. We carry a string of five to seven-year loans. Because every five to seven years, what are, we, what are we doing? We're refinancing. And every time we refinance, does the clock start over again? It does, doesn't it? So let's look at what's really going on behind the scenes. Here's the loan that you currently have, okay? 6% loan that we've got. Now, before you come to me, this is what you're currently doing. In the first year of your loan, the cumulative principal is $2,456, correct? And how much are we paying in interest in the first year? I pay, my loan, I, I pay my loan down in the first year by $2,456 and a penny. That's it. And it cost me $11,933.19 in interest to do that. First year. That's just the first year. Here's year number two. We pay, pay the loan down by $5,063.50. And how much does it cost us in interest? $23,714.90. That's a total of $28,000 paid out already. That's right. That's year number two. Now here's year number seven, before you come to me to refinance. In year number seven, we pay $20,721, and how many cents? In cumulative principal, and how much in cumulative interest? So that means I paid a $100,000 to get $20,000 benefit. Folks, this is a 400% loan. That answers question number seven. Do people with perfect credit routinely sign up for 100 to 500% loans? We most certainly do. So now you come knocking on my door to refinance your house because this is your current balance. The first thing I'm going to ask you is what, what is your balance? And what is the balance on your loan? 179, 278, and 87 cents. And I'm going to tell you that I can, get your, I can cut your interest rate in half. So we're going from 6% to 3%. Are we excited about that so far, folks? Yes, we are. It makes good sense, doesn't it? And I'm only going to charge you $5,000 in closing fees. So is that okay? That's all. Just to reduce your loan from 6% to three percent. So now, I want you to remember how much did we pay in interest on a loan so far? Eighty thousand. And I'm only going to add five thousand dollars in closing fees to your amount. There's the one seventy nine two seventy eight and eighty seven cents plus the five thousand dollars in closing fees. So our new Total balance is now going to be $184,278.87. And you have a brand new loan at 3% interest. It feels very good. Your payment went from $1,199 to what now? $776. So now then, here's a new loan, 184278 The payment now is 776 30, 30 year mortgage at 3%. The total interest on this one is only going to be 95415 that we have to pay. And the total we pay back when you add in the, loan, the original loan amount now is $279,694.80. That's all, folks, for a total of 51.778 interest return on investment. That number looks familiar, doesn't it? We've seen it quite a few times, haven't we? 
You're starting to see your familiar face with all these different loans that we have. So now, here's the old payment. Remember that one? Here's a new payment. You now have a total savings of how much? That feels good. Feels like feels very good, doesn't it? Does everybody love me so far because I'm saving your money? Uh, you love well, me so far because I'm saving your money, don't you? Jason, Jason, let me ask you a question. Go right ahead. If, if, if we were doing business together, yep. and I said I'm going to save you money, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you a great benefit, mm -hmm. all right? And then at the conclusion of our business, and you paid me, yes. not on, you find out that not only it's not a good benefit for you, you're worse off than you were before, and I made a whole lot of money doing it. How do you feel about me now? Not very good, do we? Mm. Now remember, how much did we have in interest on the first loan? $80,000. Now, when we have this, first, this new loan, the first thing that we have to pay back is the $5,000, do we not? Because the $5,000 was tagged on to the old loan amount of 178, wasn't that correct? Before we get right back to the original loan amount. You with me so far? Okay. Don't click. Let's take a look at this. Line number four. Remember now we have to pay back the first $5,000. Line number four, $1,269.68 of the $5,000 has to get paid back. How much interest do you have to pay? $1,838, correct? Of the $5,000 on line number seven represents just over $2,000 of that fee that has to get paid back. How much interest do you have to pay? Line number 10. Of the $5,000 in the closing costs that we have to pay back, $3,198.15, what is the fee for that? And folks, line number 13, $4,000 of that $5,000 closing fee before we get even to the original loan amount. What is the fee for that now? $5,926.82. And folks, on line number 16, of the $5,000 closing cost fee that has to be repaid back before we get to the 179 that we originally had on the $200,000 loan, how much do we have to pay back? $7,275.16. For a total amount now of $12,430.88 in fees. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I haven't started paying on the mortgage again yet? I've been paying on this thing for 16 months and I'm not paying on the mortgage again yet? That's $12,430 added to the $80,000 I've already paid That's to it? the bank to refinance. Does oh, everybody no. see that so far? Now I see why they're in the refinance game. That's why we keep calling you. Because between myself, my bank manager, and the investors, we get to pocket all of that. And you haven't even started to pay the original loan amount that you, the, the current balance that you had on the $200,000 loan. Wasn't that $179,000 before you came to refinance the loan and I added on the $5,000 fee on top of that and then charged you all of this and we've gotten right back to square one again. After 16 months, and I'm going to tell you, I'll see you again in five to seven years. <laughs> because you're saving $422, but on the back door, you're spending out over $12,000 and change. Has anyone shared this with you before? Do you even expect your mortgage broker to even know this information? Do you expect your CPA to know this information? 
or even your financial planner for that fact. If we came knocking on your door and shared this information to you, with you, and you went to your Uncle Johnny to tell him what was going on about what we were sharing, what would he say to you? Doesn't make any sense, does it? Do the numbers lie? Is there anything that we've shared with you so far that was not true? The numbers. It's just math. Got it? All right. Financial Here's violence, Don. Here's financial violence. All right. Let's talk about what that is. The typical family. New family starting out, they're making net monthly $4,716.10. New family starting out. They're also starting out with what? Oops, did it again. Average family has 13 different debts. 13. It's a national average. Let's break it down. Their first debt is their mortgage, right? Then they have at least one car. Three student loans. Now, we're just adding up the interest on these loans, not the whole payment, just the interest amounts. One house, one car, three student loans. Now. They actually have about three student loans each, but I'm only going to put three down, okay? And five credit cards because they were signing credit cards while they were in college. Mm -hmm. That's a total of 10 loans, not 13, just 10. The interest cost on that is $1,811.77. Their interest only payment, just the interest part, is 38.42% of their net income. What was that question? The average family pays out what percentage of their income in interest on their loans? 10%, 23%, or 35%? Most people said 23%. It's a lot more than that, actually, because Jason and I have worked with people who are paying 50% of their net income on interest charges alone. It happens all the time. All right, true or false? In most cases, you should use your debit card instead of your credit card to save interest charges. Okay. Let's see which one wins. It's the credit card that wins. Because, let me tell you something, when you use your debit card, you're using whose money? You spend your money, and if you spend your money, can you earn interest on it? All right? So you're only going to spend what's in the bank anyway for your necessary things you have to buy during the month, correct? Well, let's do this. Let's use your credit card to buy the necessary things you need for the month. If you do, can your money stay in the savings account earning interest? How about that? And let's say you keep it in there 30 days. You receive a bill that says you owe us all these things for your necessary things you needed to buy. Where is your money to pay the bill? Still in the bank. Can you take your money out of the bank and pay the bill down to zero? How much interest did you pay? Zero interest. You got to use the bank's money for 30 to 45 days for free and what if your credit card is a cash back card or a miles card? So you get all those benefits for free. And I've talked to a lot of people here that aren't from here that would love to fly home all the time just for paying your bills. How would you like that? Here's a bonus example, and we're all done. Lifting debt on churches, foiling Satan's plan. Here's a $2.5 million loan at 
Here's the interest that you would pay, total repayment, $3,385,000. That's 35.41%. Now, let me ask you this. A lot of churches who are doing this, you can actually pay this loan off in five to eight years without extra giving from the members. How would you like to know how to do that? A lot of churches have not only the mortgage payment, but they have money set aside for emergencies. And people don't like to use their emergency money to pay off a loan. Let me show you something interesting. On line number seven, let's say you had an emergency fund of $300,000, okay? You have an emergency fund of $300,000, and after all your bills are paid, you have about $10,000 left over. You follow me so far? Could you take $70,000 of your emergency fund and drop it on principal in that first month? If you did, how much interest would you save? $61,234.55. Is that pretty good? Let me ask you, if your $70,000 stayed in the bank for those six months, would you earn $61,000? No. That's pretty good return on your investment, isn't it? If, you're, if you have $10,000 left over at the end of the month, how long would it take you to put your $70,000 back? Seven months, and all it would cost you is the interest you didn't make on the $70,000. Pretty good deal. What if you kept doing that? Put a lump sum down, pay it back to yourself, put another lump sum down. You can be out of this thing and, well, actually, I have a client in Michigan that I'm going to go see next week. Just built a two and a half million dollar building. It's a medical building. I'm going to show them, I've already showed them, we're going to do the paperwork next week. How they can pay their loan off in eight Point four years without changing their budget and I'm going to increase their savings doing it when you know how much money to move and in what day and what month to move it in you can save a ton of interest if you know the rules to the game what if we put hundred and twenty one thousand dollars down you see you get the idea you'd save $103,000 in interest for that money. And it doesn't take long to put it back. If you want more information, that's it. That's the end of our presentation. We know it's late. We'll just stick around. And if you have any questions, we'll stick around and answer some of the questions. Okay, what do you think about the presentation? Okay. Now, we have, some, we have some surveys we'd like for you to fill out. Could we pass those out now? Um, is there any question? All right. Okay. And um, we did send around a sign-in sheet. Did you see those sign-in sheets? Yes. Hello. Yeah, my name is Daryl Battle. Could we, could we help uh, Elder Cargill um, pass out the um, surveys, please? Men's Ministries. Um, my question is um, your credit score. Yes. Now, when you're paying off a loan, let's say over 15 years, that helps your credit score, right? Yes. Now, if I pay it off in seven years, uh, credit score wise, does that help my credit score go up exponentially or how does that work in a credit score world? Can I, can I give you a personal experience? Sure. Okay. Um, um, a year prior to coming to Huntsville, my wife and I were trying to buy a house in Michigan. And um, because we were, um, our, our, our credit score, and I don't mind telling you, was hovering around the mid 600s. Okay. And they were, we got approved for a loan because we already had a house. We got approved for a loan, but it was conditional. It was conditioned upon what? Selling the other house. 
Well, we couldn't sell the house we were in, so we lost the, the bid on the house that we were going to. I found out about this program some years ago. Started working it. So for the first year, we paid off some credit cards quicker than uh, I don't know what, and, and our credit score shot up, but I didn't pay attention to it. By the time we got to Huntsville, and we applied for our house here, the, um, the, the crash had already happened. The mortgage meltdown had, was well on the way. So there was no way we're going to sell that house in Michigan now, because now we're upside down in it. Okay? So we got approved for the loan for our new house, 3,200 square feet, because we had a credit score in that time of over 800. So yes. When you pay your loan on time, you get a score that says paid as agreed. When you pay it off faster, you get paid better than agreed. It does help. Okay? Plus, keeping those credit cards under 50% really does help, too. All right? Any other questions? Now, we're done. I'm just hanging around for questions. Yes, ma'am. We got a question here? who is chairman of a committee. Yes. Do I need to start over? Yes. I've got a loud mouth. Uh, who is also a businessman. Yes. After 20 years, we're finally getting our school built. Yes. Uh, he's not here for the seminar, and he's a businessman, he's pastor, and he's chairman of a committee. Can we get this information to the proper people, people so that we can do something better than, than what is proposed? Well, I tell you what, sister, what we can do, we'd be glad to talk to anybody that was willing to listen because what we want to do is what the bank has been doing for a long time. The bank takes our money because the banks love Adventist churches. Absolutely loves Adventist churches. You want to know why? I, I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. All right? Because... Because most churches send their tithe in how often to the conference? Once a month. All right? Where does it sit for the month? It sits in the bank. And what kind of account does it sit in? A checking account. How much do checking accounts pay? So you mean all of our churches keeping millions and millions of dollars in the bank for the year. And what do banks do with the depositor's money? Lend it out. Making big money with it, sitting it in there, and, and we turn it in on time every single month with a big smile. Turn it in. But what, what happened with it was while it was in the bank? Here's the other thing. Every dollar that funds your departments for the year, that money sits where? In the bank. In what kind of account? That's even more money than we just talked about before. There's a lot of money that can be used to kill interest on loans while it's sitting in the bank. All we have to do is choose which account to put it in. I'm not talking about investing. I'm talking about just sitting it in the bank while it's waiting to pay bills can be killing thousands and thousands of dollars in interest, not just for this church, but for every church that's watching. And if you want us to come, just call. We'll be there. Does that answer your question? We'll be glad to talk to anybody. All right. Now, remember what Jason said. What we want to do is talk about what we can do other than best business practices, because best business practices make the bank money. This is not best business practices. This is all new. This is the pill method, and I own the copyright. Good. Yes, ma'am. What do you do when you're severely upside down in your home? What do you do when you're severely upside down in your home? There's a couple of things you could do, and what people, some people are doing is just walking away. All right? But if you're not so upside down and you want to keep your home, here's the thing. Some people say, well, I don't want to keep paying because, I, I don't, because I, I, the home isn't worth what it used to be worth. All right? But guess what? Every time you make a payment, you increase the cost with the interest payment. So if you're going to keep the home 
accelerate the payoff on the loan to cut the bleeding of the interest because that's doubling your cost. Cut your interest cost by 75%. Anybody like to do um, bargain shopping? Okay, so you like to get your clothes at 75% off, your tires at 75% off. Let's start getting your money at 75% off because what banks do is they rent money. They don't produce anything. They don't manufacture anything. Their whole business is to rent money and to rent money to you for as long as they possibly can. And here's the thing. How 95%, what's the number? 95% of us are going to go to our graves in debt. I know that for a fact because how many people do you know are debt free? It'll be about 5% of the people you know. Now here's the other question. How many of you believe you'll be debt free one day? Raise your hands. That's way, that's way more than 5% of the people in here. So here's what happens. Let me tell you how, how genius this is. We know that 95% of us are going to go to our graves in debt. More than 5% of you raised your hand, so that means you believe that you'll be out of debt one day. Do you know that it's a stroke of genius that I can keep you on the hook for your entire life and make you believe you'll be out of debt one day because if you knew you weren't, you wouldn't buy as much. And you would be probably just quit your job. Like, What's the use of working? I'll never be out of debt. And here's how it goes. I'll be out of debt one day. I'll be out of debt one day. I'll be out of debt one day. I'll be out of debt one day till you get to this age and then you start saying, I'll trick those jokers. I'll never get out of debt. I'll just die with it. Am I lying? That's exactly what you said. Next question. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I must admit I've seen this presentation several times. But I wanted to ask you to please tell us what inspired you to write this. What was happening in your life and what inspired you to give, get this information? Okay, what inspired me was um, just being broke, Carmen, and not having enough. It was, it was, it was going out the door, all right? I found out that it worked, interest cancellation on my wife's car, because it doesn't work like a mortgage, all right? I went to the credit union, and I asked them, would you accept money from me any time during the month, and would you apply it to principal? The credit union said yes. So the car payment was $400 a month. So if I make the $400 payment a month, interest accrues monthly or daily? It accrues daily. So if I let a, year, a month go by, that's a month of compounded interest accruing, correct? Well, couldn't I just take $100 and pay it after a week? And then another $100 and pay it after a week? And so I'm knocking down the principal throughout the month. I'm taking the same amount of money and saving big time interest. Before I knew it, I was six months ahead with the same money. I knew it worked at that time. I started doing some more research, and now, now we have the pill method. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you not have to request approval from the bank in order to pay month or to pay multiple times in the month? Okay, here's the thing. If you pay multiple times a month, you have to the, the uh, on your car payment, the bank has to approve it only because their software may not be able to accommodate payment like that. So it depends on your institution. And don't try it on the mortgage because you, you can cut that payment up into 30 small payments a month and they don't count it until it's a full payment on your mortgage, all right? We're talking car payments or credit cards or anything like that. But yes, on most loans, you can do that and save a lot of money. Next question. Um, coming out of college, you get the credit card debts and um, I was fortunate enough to also be able to buy a house very young, probably 26, 27. Yes. Um, about three, four years ago, I um, lost my job, which I was making great money in, and things started going downhill. 
and basically the house is we just left the house in Connecticut yeah and the bank right now is sort of like we're in no man's land where they said they're taking the house away but and at the same time I'm getting um, offers for insurance from the bank to insure the house. I'm like, okay, so is the, who owns the house? Is it me or the bank? And yeah. the doors are locked. I don't have keys anymore. Okay, here's the thing. Here's what's happening. You, you're in no man's land because what happened is during the time that there were a lot of foreclosures, okay, the banks were, were getting a lot of inventory of foreclosed houses that they could not sell. You know what the banks are doing now? They'll try to sell your house one time. If they can't sell it, they'll allow you to stay in it. I'm telling you, and not make any payments. Because you still will pay the insurance on that house, and you'll still mow the grass for that house, even though you're not paying it, it's their house, but they don't incur extra costs because they can't sell it. So you still, you're still responsible for the taxes. But here's the thing. If the bank keeps that up and you don't pay the taxes, somebody can get that house for the taxes. Get somebody. Wait a second. You, why are you laughing, sister? Get somebody you know. Find out how much the tax is and, and, and get on the courthouse steps for your house and let them buy it for the taxes. It's a thought. Got another question here. What are your thoughts or opinions on a short sale? Short sale. Short sale. Uh, now, a short sale is when you're upside down in the house, all right? And you go to the bank and say, I owe, um, I owe 150000 on the house, and the house is worth 200000 all right? So you're not going to sell it for what you owe. All right. So what you do, you go to the bank and get them to agree to accept the best offer. All right. And now the, the short sales, the bank were the banks were very motivated to do short sales. And they were saying, listen, it's better for us to get something rather than nothing. And besides, you've already will, will you read that to me, please? Because I'd have to put my glasses on. I'm trying to stay cute for the camera. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, we've got somebody, somebody's calling in with a question. So, yeah, the um, short sales work. If you can get it done and you get out, and sometimes, sometimes it's, it, it's a lot easier to do a short sale on your credit because the um, bankruptcy lasts longer. Now, if you go through bankruptcy, don't worry about it. It only stays on there 10 years. And besides that, you can't do bankruptcy again for another 10 years. So the credit card companies know that. So they start sending you offers right away after your bankruptcy. Get a credit card. Put your gas and food on it. Pay it off every month and build your credit score right back up. Next hey, question. Um, this says, this person text says, my husband lost his job after a 15-year mortgage was obtained, and we got behind for one year, just finished three months trial payment. Could this work for us? Could the PIL program work for us? Um, here's the thing. The PIL program works if you can meet your bills. You have to be able to pay your bills. Uh, even if you make 5000 a month and you spend 5000 our program works. If you make 5000 and you spend 5001 cent, it doesn't work because now we're not meeting all of our bills. Are you hearing me? Now, I'm not talking about all that extra spending we do other than the bills because, I tell you the truth, my wife was wanting to put my picture up at the dollar store and to deny me entrance because... I would go to get light bulbs and come back with $30 worth of stuff. I said, look at all this stuff I got, honey. But I, she said, what are you buying all that stuff for? I said, well, honey, it's, it's the dollar store. And at the end of the month, I forgot where I spent the rest of that money. And that's before I got on the program. 
Because now in the program, you're, first, you're forced to look at every, every penny so that you could spend it wisely. So, yeah. I had to, have to be careful about that. Next question. Yes. Um, the banks give you, I'm in the back. In the back, yes, sir. Yeah. The banks give you, at the time you, I guess, apply for your loan for your house and so forth, they give you this truth and negotiation. Closer. Truth and negotiations uh, lending uh, document that has all of your amortization cost schedule, I assume, tied to that. Yes. How do you advise us, based on what you've just presented? Okay. Now, here's the thing. Jason is a, 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 a mortgage guy. This is his thing. When we do our um, seminar, we bring mortgage people in to tell you what's going on here in Alabama. There are some mortgage people here. They're not all the same. Some charge you more. Some charge you a fair price. But Jason's going to tell you some of the things you can look into to make sure you're saving, you're, you're paying a fair price for your mortgage. Because everybody I talk to, everybody I talk to, I ask them, how much money did you pay for your mortgage? Nobody can tell me. They want to ask me what I charge, but they didn't ask the bank how much they charged them. <laughs> now, the, the, inter the interesting thing about that is that when you sit down at the closing table, the closing agent and the mortgage broker and normally the realtor really cannot explain to you properly how a truth and lending statement actually works. Okay? It is the most difficult document to explain at the end of the day. You want, you want to speak to it? So, it's the most difficult document to explain. So what we do with our clients is that before you make a purchase, before you even refinance a house, you come and speak with us before you do that. You saw the Moors early in the video when they purchased the, that house. They actually sat down with us, sat down with Don beforehand. And so what we're able to do is that you normally get all your documents, your main documents, the good faith estimate, truth and lending. There's about four or five docu documents that you're supposed to get before the closing. Share that with us and we can walk you through it. We can actually be able to pull out an amortization table based on it and you'll be able to see exactly, even in the first 12 months, first 24 months, you'll know exactly what to do in reference to the, as, as far as how it's actually working. Now for our clients that are on our program, when they actually are looking to purchase the house, before they even sit down at the closing table, they already know the month and year before when they're going to be getting out of debt, beforehand. They know the month and the year beforehand when they sit at the closing table. So they already know exactly what they're getting into. They know exactly how long it's going to take them to get out of debt. And then you can be able to make financial plans long term based on forward information. Got that? Jason, can a loan be set up from the outset to favor the client more if they do it correctly? Absolutely. And that's the key thing to it. Your loans that you're looking at, you want to discuss with us because what we will do, we will format the loan, show you exactly how to do it. As a matter of fact, there are many times that our clients will have me speak to the mortgage broker because I know what the fees that they're going to be charging. I know normally, I can normally tell the back-end fees, if there are some, and what's going on in the loan. And sometimes what we as mortgage brokers do, we actually control the interest rate. The mortgage broker does. Oh, yes. Controls the interest rate that you're going to be charged. We control that. So when someone is saying to you, we can get a 3%, many times we can get it for you for 2.5%, 2.75%, 2.3%. We can do that. But it's not about the interest cost is about the interest savings when it comes to us and, and what you're dealing with. You understand that? Any other questions? I, I have a question in reference to um, you said that yes, in mortgage right. payments if you you cannot do the two weeks thing because and I understood why because you have to pay 
the full mortgage. If I pay the full mortgage and then want to pay maybe half of that mortgage before the 30th of the month, let, for instance, my payment is due on the 12th and I pay the full mortgage and then I want to come back on the 26th and pay an additional 250 how does that affect my interest or does it affect it at all? Yes, it does. And this is what's happening. As long as you make that full payment, you can come back at any time before the next payment is due, even one day before the next payment is due, give the bank extra money and it kills interest and it knocks off months. Okay? You, that's exactly it. But you have to tell the bank, if it's a mortgage, you, they have rules on how to do prepayments. And their rule says that you have to tell us in the way that we prescribe. If you don't tell us in this way, even though we know what you want, we'll put that money in escrow, we'll keep it in there, we'll make money on it, and we won't pay you a dime interest. And at the end of the year, when you have escrow overpayment, we'll just write you a check for your overpayment and say, thank you very much, no interest. So, follow the rules. Now, here's the other thing. It matters on what day you make the extra payment to get your best um, cost-benefit ratio. It's a ton of math involved. We have a, a, a financial robot that does all the figuring out for you and tells you the right month and the right day to make the extra payment. And you don't make an extra payment every month, only at strategic times during the year. And I'll tell you why. Here's a question. Which is more powerful on my mortgage? $10,000 one time or $1,000 extra a month for 10 months? Same amount of money. $10,000 one time. So save up your money, then make a big whopping payment on that thing. Pow! But what we tell you, how long do you save it? We factor in the interest rate you're earning while you're saving that money and then that tells you when exactly to pay that money so that you can get out of debt the fastest way possible for the least amount of cost possible. So now what, what Don is talking about really is what we call optimization. Okay. Optimizing your finances. Okay. Now that's something that for the most of us we're really not able to do on our own. Optimization. Right. Here's, another, here's another question. Question in the back, sir. It's a question in the back though, sir. This yes. young lady had her I have two questions. The first question is, if I um, pay off my mortgage, let's just say I had $7,000 left, I paid it all off, and the bank comes after me and says, I still need to pay some type of interest because I paid it off too soon. Is that legal? Well, see, here's the thing. Um, it depends on when you pay it off. The, they only charge extra interest twice in the very beginning because you don't make a payment for the first 30 days. So there's a little bit of extra interest there, all right? Then what you want to do is find out what your payoff is. Call them up and say, what is my payoff and how, good, how, how many days is that good for? Because if you, if you pay it at the wrong time, you could owe extra interest and I'm telling you, you must, as part of the loan agreement, they'll take your house for that little bit of extra interest. They'll take it if you let them. Okay? So don't dispute it. Pay it. Last question. Yes. Can you pay off something too soon? You mean like uh, get a, um, a prepayment penalty? For it, mortgage. Like... For example, if you're paying for your mortgage, you get an interest write-off on your taxes. Okay. If you pay it off too soon, are you still eligible for the interest write-off on your deduction for your Well, let, let me say, I don't have any change on me, but 
here's the thing. Remember, banks are in charge of our financial education. All right? I've got to pay a dollar in interest to the bank to get 27 cents back from the government. How does that hurt the bank? That's why they teach it. So, I've got a dollar in one hand, I've got 27 cents in the other. Which one would you rather have? The dollar. So if I pay my house off early, I lose the 27 cents, but I get to keep the, hey, do you know I've got accountants that went to school and they taught them always keep a mortgage, go out and get a mortgage for that tax advantage. It's not a tax advantage. No. I'd much rather have the dollar. I do what I want with it. Now, the okay. other thing is that a lot of the, some of the loans have what we call prepayment penalties in them. And in that, what most of us do not do, we don't do the math. We just simply say, we have a prepayment penalty, and therefore, even if we have the funds, we don't pay it. But what you want to do is actually determine, what is my prepayment penalty if I pay this loan off early? And then, so we're looking at the cost, and then we have to look at what is my benefit if I pay it off early. You got the prepayment penalty or the interest savings. You follow me? And that's what you have to look at as well. So, uh, and Jason's exactly right because I'm saving, what, $300,000 in interest on my loan, on my home. How big would the pain penalty have to be for me not to save the $300,000? It would be $300,000. So, here's the thing. They use the words very carefully. If they use prepayment cost, you would say, well, how much does it cost to prepay? If they use prepayment penalty, you don't even ask because nobody likes penalties. <laughs> Next question. Okay, uh, here's a text. What about interest-only loans? Oh, I love, love, love interest-only loans. Go ahead, Jason. <laughs> love them. You sure you want to tackle that one at all? <laughs> You know, on the mortgage side, we love to sell the interest-only loans because you're, you're really never paying on the principal, right? But when you're looking at the concepts, the interest-only loan is the lowest form of payment on that particular loan that you have. Um, the mistake that individuals make on their own is that with the interest-only loan, they form their budgets around that payment. And so whatever monies that they have left over, they're using it for other things and never really paying on the principal. But our clients, they, with our clients, they have the lowest payment, which is the interest-only loan, and now they have a whole lot more money to be able to go towards principal. Remember now, without affecting their monthly budget, and that's critical. I love an interest-only loan. Our program loves interest-only loans. Yes. Um, brief me on the impact of foreclosure and how can one get out of that? Foreclosure. Well, there's going to be, there's going to be um, some negative impact to your credit for foreclosure. But it's not as bad as you think. Here's some of the things you can do. All right? What you need to do is get that credit score back up. All right? And um, if, you, if you can't get a credit card right away, you can go to your bank or your credit union, give them three to $500, get a secured card, okay? Put your gas and your food on it, because you're going to need that anyway. Gas and food, and pay it off every month. You start building. Do you know that for paying off, paying off that two or $300 every month, as the same amount of points to your score as you were paying off ten thousand dollars, so it starts to build it up. Just it builds it up just as fast. So yeah, you can. And there are, if you are a veteran, there are special loans for veterans, even if you've been foreclosed on, that you are eligible for, to uh, that you can get into a house right away. I saw it on the news just the other night. Now here's the thing. When it comes to money and problems with credit, here's what we do. What we want to do is what some, some people who are thinking about being a Christian want to do. 
they want to clean themselves up first and then come to Jesus. Now, and, and if you were given a Bible study, you'd say, no, 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 come to Jesus, let him do all the work. If you have a problem with credit, you want to get into a house, get yourself somebody who knows what they're doing. Find somebody who can get you pre-approved for your loan. Now, here is why you want to do that. He says, well, why would they mess with me? Because I have a problem with my credit. Here's why. Because if they help you, they get paid. <laughs> okay? So they're going to find every way possible to cut your problems in half. So this is what they're going to give you a game plan. And here's what we don't do. We don't go get a game plan. Get a realtor, get uh, somebody that's going to work with you on your mortgage, and get a plan that say, well, listen, we can't get it done for you now, but this is what you can do, and, I, I, and I'm almost sure we can get you in there three, six, nine months. So what happens is your time span to fix your problem is always going to be the same three, six, or nine months. The question is, when are you going to get started on it? You can get started on it now, or you can get started on it six months from now. But it's going to be the same three, six, nine months. Does that make sense? All right. Yes, ma'am. Oh, well, okay, back here. Yes. Um, yes, sir. I heard you talking about uh, how you were helping people before they got started, but I'm trying to figure out how you can help the people that already have a mortgage and want to pay that mortgage down with the same budget and not go over. How do you help those people I don't exactly understand. I didn't understand it tonight or hear it exactly. Well, we're passing these out. Did you get one of these? Yes, sir. Okay, you fill that out and you let us know who you want to talk to, Jason or myself, or it doesn't really matter. You just put it down. And then what we'll do is that we'll give you a four page report for free telling you the month and year you're going to be debt free and how much interest you're going to save and how many years we're going to cut off. Oh, it's okay. that simple. So that information tonight was just for more for student loans and credit cards? No, the information tonight was that if, the, if you want to save money on interest, you understand now an amortization schedule. You know now that putting extra money on that the amortization schedule kills a lot of interest and takes off a lot of time. What most people think of if I have a $200,000 mortgage and I have $1,000 extra in the bank and I put my $1,000 towards my mortgage, how much do I still owe? $199,000 for the next 30 years. How motiv motivated am I to put that $1,000 down? I can buy big screen TV with that money. What's your name? Uh, Glenice Jones. Okay. Come see us when this is over. Okay, thank and, you. And we'll help you. So here's the thing. But if I put my $1,000 down now, I know that I just killed fi almost $5,000 in interest. It's worth it to me now. So this is why we were teaching this, so you'll know what happens, how an amortization schedule works. Yes? I assume that the information you're giving us is for any state, but I just wanted to be sure if what you're telling us tonight would apply if you have property outside of Alabama. Yes, it, it applies in, in any state. The loans that we have in the country are the terms of the loans as far as how an amortization table works is the same anywhere in the United States. I just wanted to make a comment, basically. Uh, before I moved to sh here, I was a mortgage banker for 10 years. I understand your concept because I have practiced this. The people that are hearing this now are so blessed that they've got somebody that they can go to to lay it all out and help them. I found that in, and this was in Chicago, that in Chicago, if you went in there to the mortgage company or to the bank acting like you know what you want, they generally gave it to you, signed whatever papers, 
just to get you on the dotted line because they figure you're going to screw up somewhere and we got you. So even if you have to go in and get, you know, pre-approval from them to do what you're trying to do, nine times out of ten they'll do it if you know what you're doing. And, you know, if they can come to you and pay you a fee to go with them to the bank, it's worth every cent. Here's one, here's one thing they do, and I can't tell you who does this in town. So, but if you were working with us, we, we could do it because it's being recorded. Here's the thing. They, they have a sheet that's, that, that, that lists all their fees when you go to get your mortgage. They list all your fees. If they ask you six questions and answer all six questions, they have to give you that list that lists their fees. If you got that list that lists their fees, what could you do with that list? Work it to your advantage how? Compare. You can go in comparison shop, couldn't you? But what if I ask you just five questions? I don't have to give you that list with the fees on it, and you didn't know you were supposed to get it in the first place. So I'm going to keep you all in the process, and I'm going to sell you the loan for about three or four points higher than you could have gotten it down the road. Now, it won't hurt you very much because I'm just going to roll it into the mortgage, and it's only going to raise your payment three, four, five dollars. And that's true. And that's how you sell it, isn't it? That's how you sell it. Hey guys, uh, real quickly, uh, I'm a college student and I have a few credit cards that I'd like to pay off soon. And I was listening to the story that you were talking about whenever you said, um, you said uh, you, uh, your wife had a car and she had a payment of $400. Uh, my question was, um, did you pay $400 in the beginning of the, of the month and then, and then paid an additional $100 each week after that in order to do that? Can you please clarify that? Okay, very good. What we did was instead of paying $400 a month, we paid $100 a week. Same $400. I just paid $100 a week instead of $400 a month. And so when I paid the $100 for the week, they charged me a little bit of interest for that week. Okay. And then a lot of that money of that $100 went to principal, knocking it down. So now I get a new calculation the next week. They calculate on a lower principal amount in that next week, and I give them another hundred bucks. Now they're calculated on a smaller interest, uh, a smaller uh, principal amount. I pay even less interest. So by doing that with the same amount of money, we were able to get ahead, and I paid the car off two years early. So what's happening with that, with the credit cards, for example, the interest on the credit card is calculated by the daily average balance. Whereas a mortgage is calculated by the month end balance. So if you are making a $200 or $300 payment on a credit card on a monthly basis, if you take the payment or take the amount that you have and split it up and put it down in small increments, whether it be on a weekly basis, as Don was doing, you're actually cutting some of the interest of the effective interest rate that the bank can actually calculate for that month. For that month. Does that make sense? Here's a question for you. Can you pay off a credit card faster just using the minimum payment? Yes, you can. You want to know how? Okay. Here's how you do it. Credit card is, is a revolving line of credit, right? Meaning, once you pay it off, you can use it again, correct? So it's money in, money out. When you get paid, your money goes where? It goes into a checking account, direct deposit, most of us, correct? All right. So the money sits in a checking account making how much money? Nothing. And it sits there so that you can pay your bills, correct? You write a check. You write a check to pay your bills or you do electronic checking? Let me ask you, does, do a lot of the companies that take your check, do they take your credit card? Yeah. So could you take some of that money that's sitting in your checking account, say you got $1,000 worth of bills that you're writing checks for that will also take your credit cards. Could you take that $1,000 and put it on your credit card? Would it lower your balance on the credit card? For every day that money is on the credit card, are you paying less interest? Could you pay your bills from the credit card? 
So is your interest bill lower for that month? If you make the same minimum payment this month than you did last month, will more of your payment go to principal? So can you pay off a credit card faster using just the minimum payment? And all you're doing is choosing where you store your money because what we're talking about is interest cancellation. How can I turn the interest fee off? Now here's another thing. If you have enough money coming in that goes out to bills, if your credit card balance is low enough, let's say you owe $2,600 on your credit card, but you have $2,600 worth of bills. You take your $2,600, instead of sticking it in a checking account, pay the credit card off to zero, and then pay your bills from there, and now you get to use their money for 30 to 45 days interest-free, free, because you've turned off the interest machine. And then you keep doing that, and every dime you do pay to the credit card, 100% of your money goes to principal. And you pay it off a lot faster. Get with us, we'll tell you how to do all of this stuff. It's called interest cancellation, folks. Most powerful thing on the planet. Now, listen, we let you all go a long time ago. I can do this all night. And I'll stay here as long as you want me to. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I might not have been listening when you, asked, you might have asked this question already, but um, <clears throat> the same thing that you're talking about as mortgage payment, can you do your credit, I mean your um, student loan the same way? Very good, very good question. In fact, it's a lot more powerful on a student loan. People on our program, I don't care how big the student loans are, will pay off their student loan in an average of five to seven years. That's that much interest built up in them. Find out how much money to move and when to move them. Here's an interesting thing about student loans. There's a new program out now where you can make a student loan payment based on your discretionary income or your net income, right? So they're going to lower the payment, correct? What they're not doing is adjusting the term the term stays the same, meaning your interest costs stay the same. If your payment that you're making does not cover all of the interest costs, they're tacking the extra interest costs onto the principal and you could be making a fateful payment on your student loan for five to seven years and you owe more seven years later than you did when you started and they're not making that clear to the folks that are taking the lower payment option. Get with us, we'll show you how to use your money so that you can pay off that student loan in five to seven years. Got a question over here with the mic. I want, oh, sorry, you had... oh okay. Would you please comment on the, the negative and positive, if there is a positive, on purchasing a home where the seller holds where the seller holds the mortgage so to speak you don't go through a bank you go through the person who owns the property as opposed to going through a mortgage or a bank okay there are a lot of people who are doing doing that uh, if you're if you're um, an investor um, a a real estate investor okay you have several homes it's becoming very popular with real estate investors, especially with young families. When you, get your, when you do your program like that, especially if you make a down payment, they love it when you make a down payment. It says, listen, as long as you stay here, the home is yours, make your payment, everything is good, okay? But what happens when you outgrow the home? What happens? You wanna buy another one, so you wanna move. Because you made the deal that way, when you move, you leave all of your money behind. And that's why real estate investors love that deal. Because I get, keeps, I get a down payment, especially a mobile home. Oh my gosh. If I get your down payment, I know you're going to be in there for five or six years. And guess what? If I rent it to you, I'm responsible for cutting the grass if you don't. If I rent it to you, I've got to fix the problem. But if it's your house, 
When it needs painting, you're going to paint it because it's your house. If a window breaks, you're going to fix it because it's your house. But when you move out, I get a fixed up house to sell to somebody else. Thank you very much because I keep all your money. I love it if I'm a real estate investor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you asked earlier where do we put our money, especially from the direct deposit. For me, I put it in my savings account. I send it to my savings because I remember a long time ago, uh, a man said to me, you pay your, your bills on the first day of the month, not the 31st, because the savings goes in, the, the interest rates go in at that time or something, right? So I've always done it. What I've done is to write out the check, and I know the check is not going to hit the account the same day. So I wait till that first, and tell me if that's the right thing to do. Okay. I wait till the first to shift the money to the save the checking account, even though the checks have gone out. Um, also, I want to know, would it still work from the savings account to the credit card, just like you were saying? I, uh, Are you getting me? No, uh, ask it in a different way, that second part. The second part is... When you were talking earlier about moving the money from the checking account, why don't I put it in the credit card instead? Mm -hmm. Can I do something like that using my savings account instead? Here is the thing with all of that, okay? We have, do you have a computer at home? There's a computer at home. There's a computer in your office. There's a computer under the hood of your car. There's a computer in your microwave oven, okay? Here's the thing. What you're asking is a very complicated question that we want to still use an abacus to figure out, okay? So what I'm asking you is this. If you have a, a stove in your home to save you time and money, a washing machine to save you time and money, if you have a car instead of a bicycle to get to work, if you're buying all these things to save time, listen, I've got a robot that, ro that, that, that automatically sweeps my floor. Okay? If there was a page of, if I had a full page of three digit numbers to add up, and I got a pencil and paper, and you gave a 16 year old kid a calculator, and we got in a race, who would you? Put your donut on, because I know you're not a betting woman. Who would you put your donut on, me or the 16-year-old with a calculator? What we're talking about is when to move the money. And what banks have figured out is they don't move their money willy-nilly. They move it at optimum times. There, there are very complicated algorithms that figure all of that out. Do you know that 70% of the trades done on Wall Street are done by computers now? Computers are doing surgery. Computers, well, am, am, am I right, doctor? Okay, computers are doing surgery now. Computers are building cars. Okay, computers are running warehouses. Computers are flying planes and dropping bombs. And we're trying to still figure out our our funds with a pencil and paper. Let's figure, let's let somebody else who has does, done all that math for you tell you exactly when to move and when to move it and how much to move. We'll help you with that. But the short answer to your question, yes, it does, you, you want to move it, but you want to move it the right amount on the right day, yes. I am so happy to be attending this seminar. I believe it's a blessing to me and it's an answer to my prayers. Jason, I would like to know when I can start working with you. <laughs> Thank Tonight, you so much. I am anxious to speak with you. Thank you so much. We're and gonna see other, everybody, we're gonna see everybody who wants to, before you go home, we're gonna get your name and your number and we're gonna call you any. Well, I'm looking at the time and I would like to leave now. Okay, well, let's get, let's get her name and her number on the sheet. I did that already. I All right, then we're going to call let's, you. Let's do this. Let's, we're going to close this out, and if anyone has any questions, you can meet with us one-on-one. -on -one and we'll... Suggested readings? 
Okay, here's a suggested reading. I, excuse me, are you going to meet, are you going to call me or I have to call you? can come down we'll, at the end of this and come talk to me. Right? Yeah, we're ending I'll right now. I'll come to you. I'm and we are going to call now. you. Okay? okay? Here's a suggested reading. Anybody, anybody read, anybody read Councils on Stewardship all the way through? All the way through. You've got to read it all the way through. It is out. It is the Seventh-day Adventist Wealth Building Manual. Read the entire book. There is a method in there. Did you know building wealth is a science? Mm -hmm. Surgery is a science. Being a doctor is a science. There's a science to... Ellen White calls Christianity a science. There is a science to your money. So find out what the method is from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy and practice it. Then if it doesn't work, you can blame God. Okay. Okay. What it do you works. think? Well, one, 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 um, one final question. This, this same approach can be done with a credit union if my account is in the credit union, right? What now? If my account is with the credit union, yes. then the same thing can work with them. It can work with them, but we can tell you exactly how right. to do right. it so that you can get the, the, the greatest benefit for it. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank Jason Thomas and Don Daniel. Um, you know, I, I believe that this is information that the entire church should have received. This, this is information, and we, we, we just committed ourselves at this church to a $3.5 million loan. This is information that our pastors need. That's what you're saying. And um, uh, it's a shame that only a few of us are here. Yes, and um, I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say, gentlemen, come and do this program again, uh, because I'm not certain that more people will come. Will they have, you know, should we do this again? Yeah. Invite all the churches. Okay. Um, so you're suggesting then that we do this again and invite all the churches. Uh, um, Don, Jason, um, would you be willing to do this again? Absolutely. All right. Okay, what we'll do then, we'll set a date. If, I guess this would be after the crusade. We'll do uh, or after camp meeting? Or during camp meeting? I'm not sure if we can get it on the, on the, um, on the schedule for camp meeting. Um, but we probably can do it the week after camp meeting. We can try for camp meeting. Yeah, the camp meeting schedule is uh, printed, uh, already set. But we'll try. Worst case, yes. It's critical. Okay, um, she's saying graduation week and I'm, weekend. I'm not sure, but let, we'll, we'll search to find a time when we can do it. Yes. I have a real quick comment for everyone that's here. I've seen this presentation many, many times. I was sitting on the financial committee at my church in Miami, and we had some big projects that we were trying to do. We invited Don in, and he spoke. We got on the program. We were on the program. We had eight years left of our mortgage, and I think we paid it off in five or six months. Uh, and the pastor never told the church. We just did it. And then he told them after we paid off the mortgage and said, by the way, we paid off our mortgage. One of the things I want to caution you guys on doing, because this is what I did. I ran out and tried to 